It was about 10 years ago, as I remember the story, that someone in uh, GCI went on a year-long mission trip. This is what missiologists call a medium-length mission trip, long enough to require significant sacrifice, make a significant impact, but not a lifetime commitment. Uh, well, this missionary thought it was great. He, he was in a group of other missionaries, surrounded by people who were serious about following Jesus, making a difference in the world. They had daily devotionals. Uh, they had wonderful discussions, opportunities every day to preach the gospel and see dramatic changes in the people that they had gone to help. It was a great growth experience. Uh, after the year had gone by, the missionary returned home and submitted an article to Christian Odyssey, a ma magazine we published back then, and I was the managing editor at the time, that's how I know the story. Uh, the article was basically uh, complaining about the local church. <laughs> uh, the people in the church weren't very zealous, the relationships were shallow, the gospel was only a trickle of what it could be. And the local church was barely making a dent in the society around them. And it was disappointing. And my thought was, oh, welcome to the real church. Uh, it's not fair to compare the church to a mission where everybody is filled with youthful zeal, where everybody has an unsustainable approach to life, where no one has jobs and families to distract them. It's, it's not realistic to expect the local church to be like a mission trip. It's an unfair comparison. The real church has people who are new to the faith, people who are struggling with their faith, people who are struggling with their marriages and jobs and health, trying to pay their bills, and they don't live next door to each other and they can't get together every day for devotionals and discussions. They have a life outside the church as well as a life inside the church. They have friends and they have commitments outside the church as well as inside the church. And this is where I became disappointed with the author. <laughs> for, for all of his time on the mission field, he seemed to be away, unaware of something important about the church. The kind of local churches that had given financial support for his mission long, uh, mission, uh, for his year long mission trip. They had jobs that could help pay the way for people to be missionaries. And those jobs prevented them from having the kind of community and experience that this person thought was ideal. You know, he was right that the church is a missionary organization. But what he didn't realize is that the church is also a mission field. It's not 100% composed of people who are ready to be ordained and sent out. It's not 100% mature. It's not 100% zealous and to get dedicated. Now, it's not that I'm in favor of mediocrity, <laughs> but if, even when the church is at its best, it's going to be pulling in people who are broken and who will take some time to heal. Now, it's going to be a hospital of sick people in various stages of getting well, as well as a group of doctors and nurses and orderlies who are not 100% well themselves. <laughs> You know, and if we extend this analogy a little bit further, uh, we might say that we live in a society uh, that has an epidemic of problems. And those germs get brought into the church on a daily basis. We might represent the kingdom of God, but we are not the kingdom of God here on earth. We are far from perfect. And that's why we need people who are full of youthful zeal people who are willing to dedicate their time and their life and energies into making the church better. We need people who have a vision and a taste of how things could be. You know, the, the missionary had spent a year helping other people with problems. But when he saw problems inside the church, he was not so zealous to help. Somehow it was easier to help other people than it was his own people. And so that leads me to the title of my message. Are you disappointed in the church? In, in a way, uh, I hope you are. Because the church is never all that it could be. We're fallible. We're imperfect. Uh, but I also hope, hope your disappointment doesn't cause you to stay away, but I ho hope it causes you to stay, uh, to make the church a better place. Uh, if you can see how things could be better, 
then we need you to stay. Uh, if you can see how uh, things could be better, then you know you can be a missionary in our the, your own local community, this community. The solution to the problem isn't to withdraw, but to stay and help. Now, I also have to admit that missionaries sometimes get tired. They have enough stamina for a one-year trip, but not enough for a, for a war that takes years, where the victories are few and not very dramatic. Uh, the solution isn't to give up, but to have a realistic pace for the marathon that we are in. We sometimes have spurts of energy that we can use. Other times we have our problems of our own that we have to deal with. And that's part of life in the trenches in the real church. Now, sometimes zealous people are disappointed with the real church. Sometimes those zealous people uh, disappoint us by walking away. Uh, we're all imperfect people, uh, just imperfect in different ways. Uh, I, I, am, I am more comfortable with my problems than I, I am with yours. <laughs> That's to be expected. Uh, other people need to give us a break, and we need to give them a break. We can't expect the church to be like this self-selected group of people who all have a similar mission for, the, for a year or so. We can't, everybody to expa ex uh, can't expect everybody to think just like us, no matter how right we are. <laughs> Now we are a motley bunch. We have a variety of strengths, a variety of weaknesses. Uh, so one strength that we need is a tolerance for diverse problems. But we also have to recognize that not everybody has that particular strength. Uh, even those who do have it don't have it as always in fullness. Uh, so we are an imperfect group of people. Uh, and I fit in. <laughs> I'm not perfect either. Uh, you fit in. <laughs> You're not perfect either. Uh, so today, let's look at Scripture to see what it says about the church. Not the ideal church, the way we're supposed to be, but the real churches of the real cities in the first century world. And we could look at the churches in the uh, Asia Minor, for example, in Revelation 2 and 3. We'd see some real problems there, uh, or some good things, some bad things, and most of them. Jesus says... Nevertheless, I have something against you. Uh, or we can look at the church of Jerusalem, where it was so influenced by the Pharisees around them that they became like the Pharisees. And they were hostile to the idea that Gentiles could be part of the church. Or we could look at the churches of Rome, that they were arguing with one another about foods and the days they observed. Or we could back up a little bit and see the disciples of Jesus. They were often unable to figure out what Jesus meant. Uh, scripture tells us again and again that they didn't understand, they didn't have much faith, that they argued among themselves, or as we heard last week, that they all abandoned Jesus in his time of trial. It must have been disappointing, even though Jesus knew ahead of time that it would be like that. There's a short story in Mark 9 that tells us how Jesus was disappointed with the people he worked with. We can start in Mark 9, verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And of course he healed him. But when he said, how long shall I put up with you? It sounds like Jesus was disappointed. Maybe he exasperated with the people. Now he wasn't always disappointed. Uh, there was a centurion who told Jesus that he could, yeah, you can heal my daughter from a distance. And Jesus said in Matthew 8.10, When uh, Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Here he was pleasantly surprised, even amazed. But more often it seems that he was disappointed. Most of the people, most of the time, didn't have much faith, didn't have much understanding. 
We are repeatedly told that the disciples didn't get it. They were human beings living in a society that wasn't perfect. It should be no surprise that they, and later, that the churches they raised up had some of the same problems. Today I want to take a closer look at the church in Corinth. It had some serious problems and some serious disagreements with the Apostle Paul. Even so, it, it was, as Paul says in the opening greeting, it was the church of God at Corinth. They are, like he says, sanctified in Christ Jesus. They are made holy. Or it says in other places they were saints. Uh, they were far from saints the way we use the word uh, today, but they had their problems. Paul was telling them not to run away from their obligations, not to run away from the problems, but to stay and to fix them. Don't curse the darkness. Instead, light a candle. Be a force for unity and not for disintegration. So I think we can learn by seeing what the people in Corinth were doing. Chapter 1 uh, verses 10 through 13, Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another says, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Well, no, he implies. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. See, the people were breaking apart into these competing groups. And nowadays, it might be something like, I think we should be doing X. And the other group says, I think we should be doing Y. Uh, I think we should be like a big and growing church. And uh, another might say, I think we should provide an alternative to those big and impersonal churches. Uh, they can break into groups if those things become more important to us than they should be. Now in chapter 3, he addresses another difficulty in the church. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. He sounds disappointed. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not mere human beings? Seems like Paul was disappointed. But did he give up on the people? <laughs> Certainly not. His letter is evidence that he didn't give up on them. In chapter 5, he writes about another problem. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that even pagans don't tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who had been doing this? It's not just that there was sin going on. Even worse, they were proud of it. They thought they had a right to do whatever they wanted. And Paul, as Paul said, they were worldly. In this case, worse than worldly. Now, in chapter 6, he mentions some more problems. Some members were suing other members. They weren't acting like family, family members the way they were supposed to, but like enemies. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if, you're to, if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? What was happening in the church is church... Members were using the court system in Corinth to squabble with one another, to take revenge on one another, to shame others. 
And Paul was disappointed with what they were doing. So he writes in verse 5, I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers and sisters. Was he disappointed? <laughs> yeah. I think he was angry, too. But he didn't abandon the church or give up on it. Rather, he gave it more attention than he otherwise would have. He says they've been completely defeated, but he doesn't give up on them. And why is that? I think it's because Christ doesn't give up on his people. He does not give up on his church. This is what we see throughout the Old Testament. Although the people went astray time and again, they were still the people of God. God didn't abandon them. Even when he allowed them to be taken into exile, into captivity in Babylon, he was still working with them, and he, and he brought them back to Judea. He allowed them to be ruled by the Greeks, and he allowed the Jewish people to move to dozens of Greek cities because he had a plan for them there. Little did they know, but those Jews scattered in the dispersion would become the nucleus of Christian churches in the Gentile world. God was working that with them in ways they could not see. Even when the people were faithless, God was faithful. And we see it again in the New Testament. We were reminded again last week uh, that the, all the disciples deserted Jesus in his time of trial. Was he disappointed? Yeah, no doubt. But did he abandon them? Certainly not. He called them back. Even though Jesus denied Paul and Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus restored him three times. Peter, do you love me? And he gave him a job. Three times, feed my sheep. God had not given up on them. And then there was this zealous Pharisee named Saul who was trying to persecute the church. God didn't give up on him either. He called him and turned him into the apostle Paul. He went off to Arabia for three years and didn't have much to show for it. He went back to his hometown of Tarsus for more than ten years. Didn't seem to have much success there either. Uh, he'd been a Christian for 14 years and didn't have much to show for it. There was no church of God in Tarsus that we know about. We really don't know what happened, but it seems like nothing happened. And that would be disappointing. But Jesus didn't give up on Paul, and he brought him back to the church in Antioch at just the right time. Paul could see in his own life that Jesus doesn't give up on his people, no matter how disappointing they might be for a while. Now, I'm not saying that we should be happy to be in a worldly condition <laughs> or in a defeated condition. It's not good to be sinful and proud of it. Uh, no, we should be disappointed if such things happen. Uh, but our disappointment doesn't mean we should get up and walk away. Rather, it means we need patience and faith in Christ and prayer and work. Uh, for those of you who are married, uh, have you ever been disappointed in your spouse? <laughs> well, probably so. Uh, not me, but... <laughs> but do you give up? Uh, no. no, of course not. We, we learn to live with disappointment. Partly because we see good things along with the disappointing ones. How about ourselves? Have you ever been disappointed with yourself? Yeah. Uh, but we shouldn't give up on ourselves because Jesus doesn't. He might be disappointed, but he's also encouraged by the progress that we have. And even if we deny him three times, he is not going to give up on us. The door is always open. The light is always on. The dinner is always on the table. The room is always ready for us to come. Disappointment is temporary, not final. That's his attitude toward us, and it should be our attitude toward 
uh, others. We, we do not give up on ourselves. We don't give up on our spouses. We don't give up on our children. We do not give up on our church. You know, disappointments will come. Any church that lets us in <laughs> is going to be a defective church. Uh, the church exists to invite defective people in. Our progress isn't always as fast as we would like. We are disappointed in ourselves and we are disappointed in other people. Sometimes we're disappointed with the entire local church. But there is hope because Christ is in charge. Now, if you know anything about church history, you'll know that there are centuries of problems. <laughs> the church is not always what it's supposed to be. And in fact, has never been all that it's supposed to be. It keeps inviting defective people in. And people like us. And despite what the Catholic Church says, not even the leaders are infallible. <laughs> uh, we all make mistakes. We all have blind spots. We all have sins that we hide from others. That doesn't make them right or excusable. But it's a testimony to the grace and faith of Jesus. He is patient with us. He wants us to be patient as well. For example, uh, we don't always get what we want from the worship service. We want friendly greetings, comfortable seats, music that's always on key and in the right rhythm, <laughs> words that lift our hearts to God, announcements that are interesting, messages that are informative and inspiring, conversations that are encouraging, and food that is both delicious and nutritious. <laughs> <laughs> but we do not always feel encouraged or edified. We are not always energized by the fellowship or the food. How disappointing. We want our needs to be met. But then we are acting like consumers, focusing on ourselves. What's in it for me? The church is supposed to be about me. It's a good church only if it's good for me. Uh, well, something is missing in that, isn't it? Uh, yes, we should be getting something out of the church service, but we should also be giving something in the church service. We should be giving the friendly greetings. We should be giving worship to God. We should be paying attention. We should be giving something to the church. In the ebb and flow of life, uh, there will be times when we mostly need to receive and there will be times when we mostly need to give. There will be times in each worship service that aren't designed just for us. They're designed for someone else in the church family. It's not about us. It's about them. And our role is to support that. Perhaps it's, not a, it's someone who's not especially gifted at music or not especially gifted at speaking. Uh, or it's someone who is usually good but is having a bad day. Our role is not, on this, not to sit on the sidelines and grumble, but to encourage. Our role in the worship service is to help us see past the performance and to worship God. Now, again, I'm not saying that we should be bad at music or bad at speaking. We, we don't even want to be mediocre. Uh, that's because if you, even if you're heavenly minded, bad music can pull you down to earth. <laughs> uh, or even good music in a different style than what we're used to. A message that's poorly thought out or poorly delivered can distract us away from the point that we're supposed to get. Or people's minds can kind of wander to whatever's happening outside. <laughs> or whatever might be happening tomorrow in your home. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says that whatever we do, we should do it with all our might. We should try to do the best we can. And sometimes that means being as tolerant as we can for people who aren't doing the best they can. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, that too often our singing is just singing, and our speaking is just speaking, and there's not much worship in it. Uh, or maybe that's just me, and I'm not as spiritually sensitive as I ought to be. Uh, sometimes I'm disappointed with my own lack of worship, sometimes I'm disappointed with my own speaking. And I think that disappointment can serve a positive function, to try to do better the next time. C.S. Lewis said that we are sometimes too easily satisfied. If we're too easily satisfied with what we did, we won't grow the way we should. 
That doesn't mean we need to hang our head in shame either. Uh, we can be disappointed with ourselves and optimistic at the same time. You know, we don't have a good performance every time, but we are getting better at it than we used to be. Uh, sometimes we can be too concerned about our performance, too. It's all about our performance, about what other people think about us. It's about us. Sometimes we can be disappointed for the wrong reason. Disappointed in how well we looked, instead of being disappointed at our self-centeredness. So, disappointment can mean there's something wrong, but the feeling itself doesn't necessarily tell us what is wrong. Maybe our expectations aren't realistic. Maybe we're too concerned about ourselves. Or maybe there is something that generally isn't the way it's supposed to be. Uh, no matter what the case, I don't think we can go wrong by trying to get God's perspective on it. Well, is God disappointed in us? Well, he was disappointed with what Adam and Eve did, uh, but he still loved them. He was disappointed at the lies that Abraham told, but he still loved him. He was disappointed at something Moses did in the wilderness, but he didn't stop loving him. God was disappointed at Israel, but he kept his promises to them. Jesus was disappointed with the disciples, but he still loved them and welcomed them back after, even after they abandoned him. God is sometimes disappointed with what we do, but he doesn't give up on us. I, I think that God, if, if we can put it like this, is a pretty optimistic guy. <laughs> he, he, he can see beyond those disappointments, and he can see a glorious future for us. He can say, well, yeah, they didn't do very well on that one, but they'll do better in the future. Uh, they've got a lot going for them. Not if they rely on themselves, but if they rely on God. See, God will say, I'm the one who's going to build them up and bring them into glory. Their lives are hidden in Christ. And when I look at them, I can see beyond the blemishes on the outside. I can see the glory that will be revealed when Jesus returns to earth. See, being disappointed with ourselves, being disappointed with church, is really just a, a small subset of what it means to be a human being, a, a fallible human being that God is redeeming for his own. This is the gospel, that although we do disappointing things, and other people disappoint us, those things are not the end of the story. God, in his grace and his mercy, he forgives us, he loves, and he sent Jesus to die for all of our disappointments. One of Don Moen's songs says, We can give him all our regrets and all of our pain. He will take care of it. We can give him all of our complaints as well. You know, disappointment is not the end of the story. Reappointment is. God reappoints us for glory. Acts 13, 48 talks about those who are appointed for eternal life. 1 John 3 gives us a bigger picture of what's happening in our lives. 1 John 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. So despite the fact that we fall short, despite the fact that we sometimes stumble, God calls us His children. And since He says it, it's true. We are His children, even though we don't look much different now than we did before. But when Christ returns... We will be like Christ, and the glory will amaze all of us. If we saw someone that glorious right now, we'd be tempted to fall down and worship. You will have that kind of glory. Look around you. All the people here will have that kind of glory. Although they might disappoint you now, they will have dazzling glory in the future. If only we had the eyes to see. Whatever disappointment there is, whether it's with ourselves or with the church, the disappointment will evaporate in the kind of glory that will be revealed in each of us. 
C.S. Lewis wrote about that in his book, The Weight of Glory. He writes, It may be possible for each of us to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter, but it is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and the most uninteresting person you can talk to one day may be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. All day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or another of these destinations. It's in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another. All friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. It says, you have never met a mere mortal. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that it's okay for us to be mediocre to bad. You know, all of us who have this hope in Christ, as First John told us, we work to purify ourselves, to be like Christ. Not that we do it by ourselves, but that He will work within us to bring about the glory that He has prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Now, that's the gospel. Though we were sinners, though we did disappointing things, Christ died for us so that we might be given His glory. Not just for us, but for the people around us as well. So we can lift up our eyes, lift up our eyesight, lift up our hopes for ourselves and for the people around us. Uh, we've got a lot going for us because we've got God working in us. As Paul said, He who began a good work in us will be sure to bring it to completion. Out of the ashes will come beauty. Out of death comes new life. Out of the garbage comes glory. Out of the disappointing comes reappointing. You know, this, this season, as we look forward to commemorating the resurrection of Jesus, remember that He's not the only one being resurrected. In Him, we are all resurrected. We are all brought to new life in Him. God will renew us to something that we never were before. He will give us a new and glorious life out of the old and the tarnished one. Instead of being disappointed, we will be amazed. Although the church today has its flaws, sometimes its disappointments, all of that will evaporate when the church is revealed in all of its glory. And we will not be disappointed. Thank you.